Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia online. My name is Andy Greenberg and I am the son of the late Carol Phillips. Um, I'm joined by Henry Greenberg, the grandson of the late Carol Phillips. This lecture was endowed in her memory. It's hard to believe it has been 22 years since uh, the library first came together and um, began having in distinguished women lecturers. Um, in this program. This evening's program is made possible only through support from caring individuals like you. Please consider making a gift of what of whatever you are able and helping the library advance literary literacy, guide learning, and inspire curiosity for all Philadelphians. It's my privilege to introduce Ricky Lee Jones to you this evening. Acclaimed for her hauntingly beautiful voice and fearless experimentation, singer-songwriter Ricky Lee Jones has remained one of music's most intriguing figures for more than four decades. Combining rock, jazz, blues, and pop, her 18 albums have garnered two Grammys and a multi-generational fan base. A sought-after collaborator, Jones has been a guest vocalist in more than a dozen other musicians' works. She's also a celebrated record producer, actor, and narrator. Her new book, Last Chance Texaco, is an intimate account of her unsteady childhood, the pleasures and pitfalls of her early success, her battle against substance abuse, and her enduring position as a woman of rock and roll. Her, tonight, her talk tonight will be in conversation with novelist and musician, Wesley Stace. We're so pleased to have them here with us this evening. Wes and Ricky Lee, the screen is yours. Thank you. Good evening, Ricky Lee. How are you tonight? I'm great. I'm you're, you're, in, you're in New Orleans? Yes, sir. Um, I am and uh, the sun just going down and I live next to the train, so the train may come periodically, but I'll, I'll I'll stay. I won't go. I'll be here. Good. Well, <clears throat> here's your book. Yeah. That fantastic cover photo. Tell us about that cover photo, actually. Sure. Did you did yeah. you want that to be on the cover of the book? Or? Oh yeah, I'd pick that. Tell, that. tell us about that amazing and I would say I would go so far as to say iconic photograph. Would you call yeah. that iconic? Absolutely, it really is. So. That was taken, I think, 1979 by Bonnie Schiffman. Bonnie worked at A&M Records, and she took the very first publicity photos of me before I was signed. I think that shoot was for a magazine article, but it was never used in all the decades since, if it was even used then. I had it as my little icon on Google or something, and while I was looking for a cover, I went, ah, that's that's the cover. And so uh, that's how that happened. It was kismet. You mean, you mean I haven't seen that photo possibly before? That's right. That's and yet it seems to, in a sense, sum up everything about you from that it's time, incredible. doesn't it? Isn't it? It's incredible. And even given the novel, the 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 way you use the right, I mean, obviously it's called Last Chance Texaco, and unless people don't know, Texaco is a gas station. But, but, <laughs> but, but one of the things about it is, of course, it's also um, the car is a central theme and also metaphor during the book, isn't it? That's right. And that is my 1957 Lincoln there that I'm leaning against. So it it's uh, you know sometimes i feel like somebody else is writing this story and sometimes everything falls in place so perfectly you can't pretend like they're not laughing well we, i want to even pick up on just something you've just said but first i think uh, it would be great if we would you like to read a little bit from your sure book sure i will great Let's start out reading so set that up and, and Ricky Lee's gonna read a little bit from um, Last Chance Texaco. The part I wanna read tonight, <laughs> this reminds me of reading for my daughter. The part I wanna read tonight is from chapter four. And I like the beginning of chapter four, but I decided to read later in the second part of chapter four which is called A Summer Song. 
And this little passage is has the title of a line from one of my songs. So when they know you're not watching, they talk behind your back. My fifth grade teacher was a small square shaped bully with a crew cut and bad temper. He once manhandled me by the collar because I told my classmates, drop your pencils at four o'clock. With my stump, I finally made it onto their social radar screen. Listen, everyone was dropping their pencils because of me. They liked me. I wish I had a pencil. <laughs> Uh-oh, outside the classroom, Mr. Carter picked me up by the collar and held me up against the wall. He was threatening me with fury that almost made me pee. Please, Mr. Carter, don't hit me, I pleaded. Now the door to the classroom next to mine was open, so the entire fourth grade heard me reduced to begging. It was humiliating. I was a fifth grader that even the fourth graders looked down upon. Mr. Carter didn't care about a 10 year old girl trying to get a little social footing. There is something fundamentally wrong with an adult man's physical retribution when his feeble sense of authority has been challenged by falling pencils. I wished I would die rather than have to stay at that school. I could not figure out what was wrong with me. There was a ray of hope when I met my very first schoolyard friend, Susan Carl. She was a sassy girl with long brown wavy hair and a sweet face. She and her mother were from Las Vegas. Her mom wore too much makeup and ratted her hair up high. Susan and I bonded over being the first girls to get brassiers, which meant we were the first young girls of our class to be recognized as little women. The first bra ritual was a big deal. For once in my life, I did not feel like the outcast new kid. My nemesis, Joellen Hassel, <laughs> was no longer a threat. None of them were. Womanhood trumped any playground game as far as I was concerned. A maturing body was something far more substantial than winning a tetherball game. My little bra, along with Susan's friendship, restored a modicum of dignity just enough to get through the rest of the year. Friends are passengers on the short flights from one place to another, and few of them manage the transition of families moving. When the sixth grade came, Susan and her mother moved back to Las Vegas. We promised to write and visit forever, but we didn't. The Beatles. I first saw the Beatles in February, 1964. My cousins and I gathered around the black and white television in Aunt Linda's living room. The rice a was cooking on the stove and the fried chicken was in the pan. The Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan show. With the rest of America, we had waded through his usual muddy disentertainment of puppets and chorus girls. And now we finally got to see what this Beatle fuss was all about. What was that they were doing with their hair? Why was their hair so long? Girls were screaming back there in New York City. A wave ran through the audience and out of the television screens. By the second bridge, well, my heart went boom. We were captured, defeated, and the world was remade in their image. We were not who we had been three minutes before. The entire country had the air knocked out of it. Nothing that has happened in entertainment can compare. The violin I was once so eager to learn suddenly seemed unnecessary, square. 
ever since Mr. Ellis put my music teacher put me in the second chair of the orchestra where I faked my way through performances, I knew I was never going to make it not reading music as well as the other kids. On the other hand, I learned every note of every Beatles song I heard. I understood this music instinctually and thoroughly. I sang harmony and matched every nuance of their recordings. I imitated, I improvised, I learned. By summer, I had a beetle haircut and beetle boots and ringo rings. I collected beetle trading cards that came with sheets of bubblegum, baseball cards for beetle fans. If I could not have Paul, I would be Paul. In a life as unpredictable as mine, the Beatles gave me something I could depend on. In a world where my family might move any day, John and Paul gave me harmony that I could be part of. Unlike other girls my age, I didn't want to be a girl singer or the Beatles' girlfriend. I wanted to be a Beatle. I was not afraid of the being the boy if that's what it took to find a little glory. I would find a way to learn to play the guitar. When I first had access to one a year later in 1965, I played it left-handed like Paul. <laughs> and then I understood that the strings were backwards. So I reluctantly turned that guitar right side up. And that certainly helped me with the chords. Oh yeah, now. I discovered the jukebox, the one that they always had, that had always been there at the slop shop and I grubbed a dime or a quarter to play Louie Louie. <laughs> Mythic in its reputation as the most forbidden song, indecipherable in its pronunciation. Or do I diddy diddy, the song of 1965. As my cousins and I snapped our fingers and shoved up our feet, American rock stepped close behind. We were dancing in the street from Chicago to LA. Hang on, Sloopy still makes my toes curl up. <laughs> Fronted by Rick Derringer, the McCoys jettisoned little girls out of the cold, wet Liverpool cavern and right smack into the backseat of a 57 Chevy. It was nasty American rock and roll. If you wanted to see how vulnerable our teen boys were, listen no further than Ragdoll on the East Coast. And don't worry, baby, on the West Coast. <laughs> teen emotion was exploding like acne upon the surface of the American culture. And there I was, right in the epicenter, wherever there was a jukebox. There was a connection to the larger world. And the songs never got old. We were building rock and roll. And it would be easy to dismiss the laments of surfers and their cars, except that Brian Wilson's melodies insisted carefully that we take notice. This was every kid's lament. I guess I should have kept my mouth shut. But it was in Congress with the gentle melody that it was nailed to. We felt it. The Beach Boys made it all right to do a little James Dean as you hung five and then ah, wiped out. Our American identity asserted and defined itself in the musical conversation that was taking place with the world, or at least with Britain. Every song gave birth to another direction. I was undergoing a social and spiritual metamorphosis. Rock music was my Bible. Mine would be the first generation to make rock and roll both a lifestyle and a political movement. My parents continued to strive for their American dream. That summer I had become an AAU swimmer. Mom and dad told me that I had to take swimming seriously if I wanted to be the best. I committed. I was going to make it to the Olympics. They committed too. By August, I was fast at butterfly. I could easily glide up and over the water. 
I would press forward when others tired and I would win long distance races. I love to win. And here I didn't need others in order to feel good about myself. I alone was creating approval and accomplishments. My mother woke me up at five in the morning to practice and after school I swam laps until dinner time. My coach Mooney was an old Filipino who'd been to the Olympics for his country. He was rough and inspiring, <laughs> tapping me in the water with a pole if my stroke faltered and stepping on my hands if I grabbed the side of the pool instead of flipping. Ricardo, what are you doing? I started school looking sharp in my Carnaby Street fashion, sporting new clothes and feeling proud of myself from the ribbons and the applause of swimming and my musical summer. But Orangewood School was a kiln, an oven of sorrow, and nothing I did outside of it ever took the heat off of me. I simply could not find acceptance at school. It was so ridiculous that even the brother of one of Danny's friends who was walking near me one day said, I'd walk with you, Ricky, but the other kids don't like you. You know how the kids are. Yeah, I know, that's okay. But it wasn't okay, it hurt. The difference between this year and last was that now I could go home and listen to the Beatles. Finally, I had something real to hold on to, something that would hug me back. Yay! <laughs> Thank you very much. You seem to get um, uh, uh, a lot of pleasure from reading it. Um, of course, you're a performer, but also it feels all pretty fresh to you, or, or at least comical some of these memories that make you crack up a little every single thing i read it, it's like that with music for me as well but i don't know why but everything i read i experience as i read it um and um you know there's small emotions we pass through but i feel them so much you know it's and i haven't read it a lot you know i've done four or five of these things i wrote it for seven eight nine years well, let's say I wrote it for five years and then edited it for five more. And um, so that the final version, I was still taking things out the week that I sent it into the editor. Um, I thought there was this passage in there about meeting Francis Ford Coppola, but it, it's not in there anymore. So I'm not even totally completely familiar with the version that, that ended up getting published. You can't read it every day. Um, uh, so so tell me about why okay say you started it seven years ago and then yeah. it went through a process yeah why did you decide apart from for commercial reasons which is a perfectly good reason to do it but why did you decide now was the right time to do it and given that you decided to do it what was actually your kind of process is a boring word but what was your mo for getting it done was it pen on a piece of paper was it emails was it complete right so tell us about why did you decide it was time for your memoir at that time you mean why did I start writing yeah. it yeah. yeah I think um you know to be honest there's probably a lot of reasons um but the first one is, is the ghosts of my of my ancestors and families were yelling loudly in my ear to tell their story their stories are incredible. And I knew that my story would have meaning to me and to the larger world if I placed it in the context of my family. I can tell you the famous things I did like anybody. And it seems like every rock and roller has some drug problem. So these things are, are old news for anybody. But my family is unique. And my story with my family is unique. That's not just unique, it's powerful and wonderful and American. And um, 
And then as I leave them, and once I leave them, it's, it's the story of a girl, a young girl, a young woman making her way in the world and, and growing into an old woman. Well, I don't spend too much time in the growing part, but so, so that's, that's why I knew that I could tell a strong American story that would resonate with any human being, wherever they were from, but, but that it needed to be American. It needed to be vaudeville. It needed to be Route 66. So when you started, it's very Route 66. When you started writing it, you were writing it for your, really for yourself and you were writing it on the computer. Were you kind of just doing it when you fancied or were you quite um, disciplined about it? I had, um, I had an agent and a and a uh, early on, so um, I was sitting on the egg. I'd written my father's stories back in the eighties, a few of them, the Scorpion story, and the first story I started writing was my mother's story. So father and mother, um, and I knew I wanted to tell. The, I felt I wanted to tell the stories according to song titles. So on Saturday afternoon in nineteen sixty three. There's a whole year of wonders, wonderful stuff. So that was how I first started. I, I, and then I, I left that idea, but I started with songs. Where does that title lead me? Let's see where we go. And at first I tell much too much. I wanted to tell you about every horrible um, person who, who tried to kidnap me and almost killed me. I wanted to tell you about all the big darkest colors and the big brightest colors, but what I learned after a couple of years is that um, that's exhausting for the reader and it changes how they measure the rest of the palette. If you tell them too much or it's too dark, how can they enjoy the lesser things of just, so I took those out. I left one in so, you know, it's dangerous for women. I left in the, the story of the guy in Mexico, yeah. but but I took out other ones because it, it's just, it's hard being a woman and it's too much to tell that story. So it was, it was an incredible process of the book or writing the story began to change me as I edited how I told myself my story. I began to change. I began to be less angry about those men who tried to kidnap me or angry about that or frightened about that i began it's a it's a miraculous and amazing process that the book began to speak back to me well i mean you know um in the book we could say i think that for anybody who's in any doubt about this, the book does not start off with the recording of Chucky's In Love or your rival in LA and travel through to a lengthy uh, discussion of Ghosty Head and the single you made last That's year. Right. You know, yeah. The book is basically 175 or something pages about your family before you really set off for the trip that will, you know, and, and that is, you know, there's a little bit of uh, Wizard of Oz, a little bit of Huck Finn. It's a it's a picaresque at that point. And then you're off to LA. And then after about you know 200 pages, then the, the next the next half of the book is from you know Chuck Chuck. You know the the first album and well pre the first album. Yeah. To, so tell us let's let's deal with this as much as we can talk before we invite some questions. Let's deal with the the book as it should be dealt with which your childhood was interesting i mean you're you there's a parent whose family was from vaudeville and there's a parent you know who was in a kind of a, an orphanage and so for those who haven't read the book yet because not a lot of people have had a chance to and obviously that is a motivating factor for the book so just tell us about sure. your mother and father i i knew this story was fantastic uh, without me in it, and that the people are buying it because of my name, but um, but that the fame part, it I didn't want it to be less than, but it 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 would equal no more than if you would begin at the because when you say it that way, I go well, I don't want to read about her. <laughs> I don't want to read about her family, but 
if it wasn't a famous person telling the telling the story, it would be a, a wonderful and strange story. And that was what I set out to write, almost like fiction. Here is my story. Here is my life. And um, so once I once I set out to do that, it delivered itself really easily. And um, I had not wanted to, there are two things. One is I had not wanted to do what I ended up doing, which was to lead to the big night and then in the book. That's not what I want to do because, but there's nothing to prove, you know, because, but I felt when I started, if you do that, you're saying to people, that's the most important thing, but that's not true at all. That's, that's just a story. It's a book and the timing and tempo of the book wants to go there. And then afterwards, we'll gracefully let you off. This is no more than um, the persona I had. None of it is me in totality. This is a story I crafted carefully. It's all true, but it's for people to enjoy. It, and the other part was um, early on, I had these beautiful stories of mother and, and I wanted to start with mother and, and, and I love Rogue, don't get me wrong, but I went over there to edit it and they said, we want to put, we want to start with Saturday Night Live. And I was, oh, okay, okay. And when I got home, I was like so depressed. And my friend said, what have you done to your beautiful book? This doesn't belong at the beginning of your book. And if she hadn't shook me and woke me up, I wouldn't have said, I'm so sorry, but that's just, I know that's the memoir you thought and, 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 and that's what a rock, but this is not the story I'm telling. I'm telling the story of my family. And got they, you know, it was it was hard on them, but in the end, um, we're all um, lovers and sisters now, and so it's much better now. But it was a hard thing to convince them that I knew what I was doing and 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 win their support, which which I did win. And so, just tell us a little bit about you know that that you know you had two very. You, your parents are a defining, you, your parents are a defining you know as my parents are a defining part of who I am but they, oh how can I say it it was it a difficult it was a difficult childhood right I mean I don't think of it as a difficult childhood you know we normalize everything that's just what we do but my mother had a difficult childhood my mother was raised in orphanages and she was kidnapped by a social worker when she was three years old and taken to an orphanage. That is a story worth reading. My grandmother running through the cornfield trying to uh, escape. <laughs> My father um, was raised by vaudevillians. And, um, and that was exciting when I finally got to play a vaudevillian. So these were two amazing characters and, and you know, father jumped on a, a freight train when he was 12 years old and rode it to Chicago. When they meet, uh, rode it to Arizona, when they meet in Chicago, you know, after the war, what I wanted to do was honor their generation and talk a little bit of, uh, about what's dying now with the last of, of them swing music and the way they danced and the kind of manly men they were and they were alcoholics and they were always fighting and who they were because now who we are is getting old. And that, you know, I'm at this place on the mountain where I can see them and the ones that that were before them and the ones, it's a great place to be. And I want to tell the story of what it's like to be here and be a part of the folding of generations and in rock and roll to have been there early on. I mean, I'm not there in the 60s, but but I got there in, in 1979. So I got to be a part of how women do what they do in music just a little part but i got to be a part of it well i mean you know you are uh, to move forward a little bit in time you are you know one of the more powerful earlier memorable women to me of my generation um 
in music. I mean, I remember very distinctly when your first record came out and it had uh, a certain um, uh, forwardness and sexuality to it that wasn't what one associated with a lot of the 60s artists necessarily, the less bluesy right. ones. And also it wasn't quite of the folky world either. So it wasn't quite a kind of Joni Mitchell experience. Um, so that put you very much at the uh, the front of something, which I'm sure is why you were on the cover of Rolling Stone a couple of times, because you know you you were a, you were able to put that sexuality out with you, and in a sense, you know, and you you make quite I'm sure valid claims that you have made it easier for other women after you in music uh, because of putting yourself out there. Well, I was hoping that it, 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 first of all, probably I was on the cover because I was sexy, but probably also because I was a successful musician and composer and singer. But yeah, I was, I was kind of sexy. I thought at the time what I brought was, I at the time, and I, I still think that I brought sexuality to a, to a serious songwriter stage. Right everything was so divided and if you're a, if you're a, a folk rock you better not have any sexuality or we won't believe you or listen to anything that you do and i was like nah, i like i like mick jagger tina turner and i like uh laura nero and randy newman and i'll do whatever i want up here because it's my show and i think that um that was a courage that I had, but it was also a confidence. I, I wouldn't have done it and couldn't have done it any other way. I hope that reverberated. You know, I saw Madonna a few years later in lingerie and stuff. And that, well, that wasn't really what I had in mind, but all right. So, you know, it evolves in its own way. But what I think I undervalue about myself most is my work. Um, I talk about so many other things, but I don't ever talk about the value of the kind of strange melody I write and the variety of things that I'm attracted to from traditional jazz to the strange poems or sermon on Exposition Boulevard or wherever it is I wanna go. And I've suffered for that because, yeah. you know, in our work, they like to know just who you are. Yeah. And if you keep changing it, I would probably feel the same way. If you keep changing it, how do I, I, I it's because it's more than music they're buying. They're buying um, an extension of, I don't know, I, I guess an extension of themselves. So when they buy me, it's a wider concept, I think. Then. And so my fans are very, maybe everybody's are, but my fans are very, very um, fierce. Well, I mean, and not to make it into, you know, uh, I realize that you were who you are, you were and are, but, you know, that whole first, our first, whole first exposure to you also, uh, gave us an image of a kind of bohemianism that, uh, if you don't mind me using that word, that I think is really, was really not anything other than a cute 60s girl in a beret depiction of bohemianism. I just don't think that was a very common thing. And I'm wondering, without talking about the Tropicana Motel, I'm wondering whether that kind of bohemianism and the way you were willing to put yourself out there in that way that tied in with the jazziness of what you were doing, the verbal dexterity of it, um, whether that was also part of the kind of, I'm sure, I know it's a fine line between self-confidence and kind of neediness in a funny kind of way, but that kind of thing that you gave you the self-confidence to let yourself get into rather improvised and dicey situations in your personal experience which you seem in the book to dive headlong into in a way i would not encourage my 15 year old daughter to do so am no. i right no one would <laughs> no. so tell us about that do you see 
That was okay. such a long thing. Like, give me some part to, to respond to. No, just answer any part. <laughs> no, it, it was good. Okay. I just, okay. I don't okay. know what, what I'm saying is, is the confidence of that kind of bohemian persona completely part of that thing that meant that you were constantly getting into these dicey situations, which mm. you seem to throw yourself into headlong throughout the first, well, all of the book? You know, the first thing I think of when you're when you're saying that is I can't know exactly what it is you think when you see that persona, but I'm guessing that um, because it became used up really fast, didn't it? And uh, yes. that was the part that people yes. went, I'm done with that. And I also went, I'm done with that beret. So. So that was the most sellable, but also the most tiresome part yeah. of the of the marketing of Ricky Lee Jones. But Bohemian comes because I'm associated with Tom Waits, who's also who's the Bohemian, right? If I hadn't introduced him as my boyfriend, who knows what words would have been used to talk about me? So. But I come from a fan. If there were ever Bohemians, yeah. middle class Bohemians, that that was them. You know, they didn't have the ability to to. <laughs> just, they were always moving, and and you know, my dad was painting and playing music and working just to do art. So it depends on what. That's what I mean when I say it depends on what your definition of what, when you say Bohemian is, but. The cute part of it, you know, I am a little sweet. Some of that is me. I I am rough and I'm sweet. I'm blunt and I'm shy. I'm I'm a complicated a complicated person, you know. And so some of what they market was really, um, you know, as much as I didn't want it to be, that that was also me. You know, that was me. I also. find I, I, that's terrific to hear. I find in a lot of memoirs, musicians' memoirs these days, that uh, people, it's, it's, it's a style of memoir where people kind of write a lot up to the very moment of success, and then that's the end of the book. Yeah. You know, Patti Smith just oh. done, that. Richard Thompson's kind of just, it's a kind of a style of memoir. The basic point being that those years of your family growing uh -huh. up and first making it are so indelibly part of you that 40 years of touring since and putting out different albums that you've tried to make as good as possible and this person, but that none of that can replace. That's would you right. say that's true in other, and so a simpler way of saying that is, would you ever want to do a second part of the memoir, for example, where it was catching up with the music you've made when the book ends, if you see what I mean? If it was as good of a book, I mean, I, I have some ways, I, you know, I'm working on another way of talking about things, but the part after that isn't anybody's business. It's my fan, it's my self raising my daughter and her life is private. Nice. So, um, and it's just not as, it's not as compelling of a story yet. You know, I do have a way I want to tell it, but not, but not in, not in a memoir. So, um, so I think not, I think not. Yes, I think, I, and I, um, uh, let's just, uh, uh, what, I'm just going to ask a couple of pretty random, pretty quick questions. You refer to yourself in the third person in the book. Sometimes. Do you do that in real life? <laughs> Hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, but um, do you think I think it comes from you know a years of wanting people to write better stuff about me. So I probably would, you know she's really very good. Um, so probably just use whatever language felt like the way I wanted to tell that story. But I don't think I say it's not like James Brown. James Brown's feeling. James Brown woke up feeling pretty good today. It's not like Ricky Lee Jones feeling pretty good about it all today. God, I hope not. No, I don't. Um, you live in New Orleans. I mean, you you know you you. I think the movement from the book is Illinois, Arizona. Pacific Northwest, 
yeah. Arizona again. Well, uh, with the family up to Olympia, and then I left for California. Yeah. For, right, right, right. So, um, and then you're in New Orleans now. Mm -hmm. Um, tell us about, I was interested in your relationship to superstition and the supernatural in the book generally, though I know it's not easy as an excuse to say, I don't quite understand these things, but I feel, you know, I felt strongly in the book a sense that you are attracted to, you know, supernatural things um just tell us about that you're in the home of it now what's happening down there <laughs> well uh i stay away from it down here because they they made a religion out of it yeah. so you don't ever want to get involved with literally, religion literally but um i am always aware of a, of a conversation a response from the invisible world and um I've always been there, you know, I've always been talking to the camera <laughs> since I was a little girl and um, and my invisible friend was probably a way of, of also connecting with that. But I feel I it's not that just that I feel watched or contained or part of, but I really feel like it it responds really really quickly sometimes it's in the shape of say my my dead mother if i say mother i'm having a hard time and help me with this M maybe something will happen that'll make me think that could be my my mother or i'm making it up but but regardless of, of whether it has a name to it i know i'm part of an invisible world and we all are and the more I uh, don't try to label it or give it a name or or give it words, the more powerful it is. That's fascinating. I very much, in one thing I loved about your book is that, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I tend, I read quite a lot of memoirs, partly only because the Philly Free Library keep asking, so politely asking me to interview people, which I enjoy to do very much, but the, like a lot of memoirs by songwriters who I consider, or no, more importantly, who consider themselves to be poets, read rather badly on the page. They're, and one particular right. example, I don't mean to pick on him because he's a genius and, he's, and he runs the who, but Pete Townsend's book was a very dull book linguistically. It sat there very flat on the page. It was a good book in other ways. Uh -huh. Your book, is not like that at all. I found it to be very like my experience engaging with your lyrics or indeed listening to you sing and listening to your, do you find that you in writing, did you find the experience, or obviously the experience is different, but did you find it different to writing lyrics? Do you find your mind runs in a kind of a rhythmic lyrical way? Because I found it to be very rhythmic, the writing of the book in a very satisfying way. I've heard this word before. Somebody else said the rhythm of, of how you write is like music. I didn't see that at all. They seem like two very different kinds of jobs to me. But people who experience it are, are saying that it's similar. So um, does that answer that? There was when you started, I had a um, an answer I was going to say, but I forgot what it was. But because the rhythm thing was like, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm hearing about the rhythm of it. Um, I just, I, I think it's a difficult thing to do. And I think it can only bespeak the fact that that's the way you think. And that's the way it came out on the page. And, you know, I was very interested. Uh, uh, I, I'm going, I'm now going to ask questions coming in from there. I've been encouraged to move on to the question, <laughs> uh, yeah. which, which can only be to do with the lack of quality of my own. No, it's because we're running out of time. But um, I was very interested before, while I start picking these questions, um, Tell us about West Side Story. I was I did want to say one thing about what you said about flat on the page. Initially, um, one is in love with the sound of one's own voice and one's prose and one's descriptions and and <laughs> ponderings and perhaps and sometimes. And at some point, my friend said, you can't write this way. You got to use a direct active voice. And I went, oh, that's so pedestrian. I'm not gonna, 
And little by little, the more I did it, the more I, I didn't qualify what I said, the more I didn't go sometimes I think, but said, I think the better it began to move. It began to move like it had wheels. So I learned how to write a book. And it's not like writing a lyric. It's not like writing anything else. You, you have to, you know, and I like my prose, but this is not, I didn't sell you a book of prose. This is a book of, that needs to move both short stories and in a larger arc of a, of a bigger story. And that's what I, I think I did. But I had to learn that. So I just wanted to answer that thing of some yeah. Some writer, some great musicians just might not know that, that that's just not going to be that enjoyable. For well, people. what I always say, having written novels and lyrics, it's like they're completely different disciplines because everything you learn to do in a lyric, which is to leave things out and make that's it right. Hard, you then have to exactly you know, exactly. I don't want to tell people what to think about what I just wrote. You have to tell them what to think about what. Yeah, you, yeah. I know. Um, so, <laughs> West Side Story. Well, so, yeah, well, actually, I'm going to segue into the questions because okay. I, I was going to ask about it anyway, but I'm just up to the, says William Buddendorf, I'm just up to the part of the book where you fall in love with West Side Story. Have you ever considered writing a musical with new songs or jukebox style using your catalogue of songs? I've always wanted to be asked to write a musical. Um, not as uh, driving for me now, but um, because it takes money and other people's interests. You know, I, I could write a musical right away. You know, when I did the magazine, I created characters and, um, you know, and they stood at the edge of the stage and said, oh boy, call from the court. And then another Monday, another fight. That was for three, four voices. And so I have experimented with it. I wanted to do it. It didn't happen, but I'd be happy to move onto the stage anywhere to keep being creative. I'd love to do. Um, how the John Ruth Finoski asks, because um, I'm a big fan of Girl at Her Volcano, so I'd like to, uh, uh, how did you come to release Girl at Her Volcano as the most perfectly realized 10 inch record ever released? I mean, well, you could say, I mean, there are a lot of very old 10 inch records that it might not be quite as perfect, given that's what they were, but that's what he said. It's a beautiful album and a beautiful object. So tell us about Girl at Her Volcano. A it is a beautiful thing. To him, it's the most beautiful 10 inch ever released. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, I did that because um, I'd been doing jazz since before I got signed. And with the big um, hoopla over Chucky's in Love, and I was doing jazz on, in the tour, you know, doing Lush Life and My Funny Valentine and a couple other things sometimes. But I thought people don't know I'm a jazz singer. And um, also <laughs> it was gonna take a while for me to write the next, next work. Um, so Barbara Gear at Warner Brothers mentioned this 10 inch idea. He said, they, the old jazz records were 10 inch. Why don't, you, why don't you do that? You don't have to do 40 minutes. It's like 28 minutes, 32 minutes. So, um, so what I started out doing as always ended up something quite different, which was um, a little bit of live stuff, a recorded thing, somebody's original song um, under the boardwalk, because we used to do that to warm up before the show and um, walk away, Renee. And uh, but that's so kind what you say. I had so much trouble with Warner Brothers trying to put that out. They said, people won't find it in the bin. I was like, if they come to look for my record, they're gonna find it in the bin. Don't worry about it. So they created at great expense, like a 14 inch or 12 inch pla uh, paper thing that would stick up as high as the record so that people, <laughs> and the things that they are thinking of, but they think the consumer is an idiot and they won't, uh, they won't go, oh, look, this is so cool, it's different. Um, so yeah, that was, that was my first lesson with, um, with people who, 
who mean well, but have these jobs and this is how they do their jobs. And they don't want anybody messing with how they do their jobs. Well, remember that's the Especially only artist. Well, remember that's the only reason they came up with those ridiculous long boxes for the Exactly. Students. So they fit, so two of them fitted into the record rack. My I mean, fault. The exactly. worst use of cardboard in the history of the world. So ugly, yeah, yep, yep. Um, Raina Lieberman, uh, I think that's Raina. Uh, hi, Ricky. Who are you listening to now? I'm a big fan. Uh, you know, I'm like most people, the records are like books to me and I go back to the same ones over and over again. I've heard a few young women, but I, um, uh, I don't know their names. So uh, it's just the same records. When I, I, I've been listening to Traffic and Blind Faith a lot in the last few days while I paint my house. I tend to return to John Barleycorn or um, Astral Weeks or Beat and Fleece and the things that, that I loved when I was young. I, I still listen to those. And there's a good, there's a very, uh, cosmic uh, Van Morrison story in your book, which we won't, we needn't give away. <laughs> People will be, um, when you talk about jazz, says Evan Charks, uh, what jazz musicians would you uh, uh, say influenced your music or your style sure. most of all at any specific vocalist like Ella or Dinah? Um, Coleman Hawkins had the biggest influence on me as a singer. I, I uh, went to the Salvation Army when I was 16 and said, I want to know what this jazz stuff is. Now, understand my dad had Nina Simone and Ella Fitzgerald, so I'd heard them and I, you, you might imagine they had an impact, but really my father is um, who I imitated most, so they impacted him. I, he impacted me. But the album that I found at the Salvation Army was The High and Mighty, High and Mighty Hawk by Coleman Hawkins. And it had my one and only love on it. That's so beautiful. That was my introduction. That was the first time, maybe a little bit of Jeff Beck and a little bit of Jethro Tull. But that was the first time I listened to and was captivated by a, an instrumental record um and i still have it i still have it today um as far as singers go jazz singers you know i, I loved ella but betty carter had an unnatural impact on me i think i i saw her live and i think people have impact on you when you relate to them a little too much and she was so animated and she was so young and the way that she sang was conversational. And uh, and I was, and she was so beautiful. I fell, I fell in love with Betty Carter. So I think um, when I listen to Pop Pop, I think, yeah, listening to a little too much Betty Carter there. But um, other than that, I think they all had a healthy impact on me. And Betty was the only one that I started trying to sing like you, <laughs> try to sing like her a little bit. Yeah. Do 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 you um hear any specific uh, musicians since you with whom you do or do not have contact, whom you think? Oh, I I think that I'm not I'm not talking about uh, personality or, but who you think. Oh, that's so nice that they've they've kind of recognized me. I mean, has somebody claimed you as an influence who you've thought, wow, that really warms my heart? Well, um, not much, no. There's been a few that I've gone, that girl listened to me, but Ricky who? Uh, so I think that um, when I first heard Tori Amos, I went, now that girl listened to Kate Bush and Ricky Lee Jones. That and he listened. I can hear that there. And when I met Tori many times, she was very sweet. And um, but um, I haven't heard in no. The answer to that is is no, no. Uh -uh. But you uh -uh. did just, you did just refer to yourself in the third person there. Just by the way, not that not that I'm counting it. 
So isn't that, uh, the, the, that girl listened to Ricky, so isn't, I set myself out and listened to her uh, because it, because oh, it would be egotistical to say, I'm going to have to work on that, to say she listened to me. She listened to Ricky Lee Jones over there, <laughs> that, that thing over there. That's interesting. Um, I'm just, uh, it's, you can pay me. Think about it. This therapy session, you can, I'll just put this in the mail. <laughs> um, you started so it. <laughs> Mark Barnhill says the book is a revelation. He loves the book. Um, looking backwards, there is a clear narrative arc. Uh, when you turn the telescope around, what was, it's a great question. Connecting your childhood to your breakthrough success, when you, there's a narrative arc. When you turn the telescope around, what was the forward vision like? Did you have a forward view by which you penciled the arc of your career? Or what, I don't know whether he's read the book or not, because I, having read the book, kind of know the answer to the question. But, or were you always in the moment then and able to connect the dots only looking back now? Great question. What is the question? Well, the question is not was it all some master plan, but you 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 put a nice arc on it now but looking back did you have any kind of a plan at all i suppose is the question well for me um i was going to say great art but i think uh, for me the reason i do it is because it's going to teach me something by the end of it, whether it's a song or an album or a book. So there's always something I find out that I didn't know when I started out. Maybe I knew, but I kept back there, but it's always a revelation. It's always a revelation. Um, but I don't know how, I can't plan. It's visceral. I sit down and I, and I see where I go today with the understanding that I probably know where I'm going, um, but I don't write little white cards. You know, there might've been a year I did that, but, <laughs> but for the most part, I just see where it goes and trust that I know. Are you always kind of working on a new musical project, even in the back of your head or on the side of your desk? I think uh, so. You yeah. are. I've got songs, I look at my piano, I have songs I've been working on and sitting on, I've got seven or eight of them for the last year and a half. When it's time, I'll bring them out and tell them, you have to get finished now, so make your choice what you want to be. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, if, if I'm trying to finish one, but there you go, the key word, trying. Um, I'm a really good starter but finishing is hard for me. The reason, the end, whatever it is, it's, it's very hard for me to deliver that. So. Is that to do with um, perfectionism or is it to do with... Um, it could be so many things. The onwardness of the process. It could be, you know, because once you let go of it and it separates, the new, the new part of life is coming. The, it will deliver you to the business world, to the audience, it is separated from you now. And people will talk about it. They'll say bad things, they'll say good things. So I try to keep them near as, as long as I can. I think I love the process of creating them, but you can't sit on them too long or they just get old and, and they, never, they never are born. Um, so I think it's for a number of reasons. Um, I actually don't, I, I'm sorry if I'm going to ask you a, a, an ignorant question now, um, because I honestly don't know the answer to this. Have you toured solo ever? I, sure. Um, I'd say 97, 96, and right. for some years because I couldn't afford to did take you enjoy, Did you enjoy that experience? Well, I, I'd have enjoyed it more if I didn't have to do it. Um, <laughs> it was really great at first because I was a pop star and I really did depend on them playing that solo that way. And then I sing. And if I played anything different than what I, I would go, oh, where am I? <laughs> you know, it was, it was like a, a, an erector set. And I thought, that's not who I want to be. I, I want to get to the point where I can improvise an entire night on stage. I, and so 
what, you know, I'm so far from it now, but I know when I first stood on stage by myself to play those songs that, well, I wrote them by myself, but as soon as I wrote them, the producers turned them into the songs that were on the record. So they hardly got to live a life in me by themselves. Yes. So I had to learn to play them the way they had originally been written. That was invigorating and exciting and frightening and all the things that that make it exciting to be a new artist because you're kind of frightened. So um, so that was that was good. But then I had to keep doing it and and it was just work. It was really hard. It is a very weird situation, that thing where you write a song and you kind of know how to play it. And then you have to learn the album that was actually the, the way it was actually recorded on an album that includes the chords that you actually didn't write and don't actually know how to play. Yeah. That's quite that's an interesting experience. Uh, somebody says Marta Riga says, I hear I hear Ricky Lee Jones in Edie Brickell. And I would say that's probably a pretty good call. I'd say that too. Yep. Um, just a random question from here, but I think it's an interesting one. What was it like working on Easter Parade with the Blue Nile? And that is such a beautiful recording. And how did that collaboration come about? Well, I was living in Paris and my father died. My father, a Jones, I decided to go to Wales to see if I could see other Joneses. It was a... Uh, a strange thing to do. And while I was there, I went to Scotland because I had heard this band, the Blue Nile, and they had enchanted me. That big voice and and his romanticism and the rooftops and old men and women and all of it. I was like, what are they? So I went to Scotland. I, I thank you for the chance of telling this story. And um with my new husband and I fell asleep and I had the strangest dream of dragons or fairies of light exploding over my head. I think there must have been firecrackers. <laughs> but I had the most vivid dream and when I woke up, the Blue Nile had called. Um, one of the Pauls of the Blue Nile had called and they came over right away. They were like little kids, like, whoa. And we became friends. Um, we hung out a bit. And when they first came to America, they they came up on my stage first. They, they were very frightened. So I had them up. They first played with me. They came to my house in Ojai. And, um, and so that's how that happened. So, um, it was in that frenzy of friendship that I came over to Scotland to play on this um, television show with them. My record was called Traffic from Paradise. And I think the name of the TV show was something like Halfway to Heaven or something. So it was like so beautiful. Singing with um, Bonnie Raitt. I sang with Bonnie Raitt once and she said, singing with you is like having sex. I understand what she meant. Singing with, with Paul Buchanan was so incredibly intimate that, that I think I was embarrassed. It was so emotional, the sound of his voice, the, the feeling of our of the vibrat of the harmony was so powerful for me. Not and and that song, Easter Parade. What is it about that song? It's it's heartbreaking and beautiful. It's just a moment where time stands still and he sees his beloved, I think. Um, so it was, I was enchanted with them and uh, and their music at that time and, and, and was lucky enough to meet them. That's the only band I ever set out to meet. And, uh, and I met them. It was like being with the Beatles, man. For us, Sal said it's like being with the Beatles, and it was. Um, uh, and just to end, uh, Frank White says, please just let Ricky know how much her music has influenced my life. Thank you. And I'm sure that uh, many people who are in the audience uh, watching tonight uh, would agree with that. And I'm sure they would like to join me in thanking you, Ricky Lee Jones, for writing 
Last Chance Texaco and for talking with us and answering our questions this evening. I had a lovely time and thanks to the library for having me on with such a distinguished parade of women who've been on before. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's all thank Richard <laughs> Jones. Thank you.